Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us and welcome back to season two of Hidden Treasures, the live show where we take you behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum here in London. As always, I'm your host Connor and I'll be exploring the collections with you. And today we're coming to you live from the Mollusk Collection, which is actually one of the oldest collection areas we've explored in all of Hidden Treasures, so I'm super excited to get stuck in. Um, now, if you've seen this show before, you'll know how it works, but as a refresher, we're live for the next half an hour, and this show is for you. So if there are any specific specimens or cabinets or, or drawers that you want a closer look at, that you want to look inside, I'm surrounded by some really cool looking cabinets, um, that's totally up for you to suggest in our live chat box. I've got my phone on me, so I'm keeping track of all of your suggestions that come through, but make sure you get them in nice and early so you can come to as many as we've got time for today. And as always, every week we are also joined by a museum expert scientist. Now today we're joining John Ablett, who is the senior curator in charge of the Mollusk Collection here at the museum. So if you have questions for John, please pop those in the chat box too. Once again, nice and early, so we can come to as many as we've got time for. And also make sure you stick around to the end of today's episode, uh, in which we'll be revealing where we're heading in next week's episode of Hidden Treasures, because as you probably know, if you've been watching along with this season, uh, we're coming to you live every single Tuesday at the same time, 12.30 p.m. British summer time. So make sure you stick around to the end to find out where we're going in next week's episode. And just before we get started, I want to let you know that we are in a, a live working space. Um, there are also some ground works going on outside the museum for the Urban Nature Project currently as well. So if you hear any rumbling, any heavy machinery, that's what you're hearing. Uh, part of the fun of being live. Um, but for now, let's go and meet John and check out the collection. So if you want to follow me around uh, into the rest of the collection. Uh, hey John. Hi, hi, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much for letting us come down and explore this whole area of the museum with you. Um, I'd love to find out what it is that you do. What's your day today <laughs> here? <laughs> so, like I said, I'm one of the curators in the Molluska section. There's three of us in total and we look after an estimated eight million specimens. So right. either dry shells or whole animals preserved in liquid. And I always tell people that my job as a curator, it's a bit like being a librarian. But instead of looking after books, I look after preserved animals. Right. Just like a librarian, we want to keep them in order so that any time any of the scientists, either inside the museum or from anywhere around the world, need to find that one special snail, they know exactly where to look. So you, so you have track of where everything is in here, right? Yeah, it's not just in here, but okay. there's a lot of it. <laughs> And what's your kind of like day to day like? So obviously you've, you've mentioned there might be research coming in to look at things, but what kind of other things you get up to on like a day to day? Yeah, I mean, re external research is a huge part of my job and something I really love doing. So, you know, people coming in and, and answering inquiries, but of course London's a very expensive place to visit. Yes. We have a worldwide collection. So often we deal sort of remotely with emails, phones, letters uh, today. So these are real things that I have to do. Um, a gentleman from Vietnam sent me back some tissue samples that I lent him. Right, okay. So he was using these to extract DNA. Yeah. Uh, and he sent them back. And they're they, tiny. They're tiny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's going back in the collection. Uh, a gentleman uh, from Australia uh, asked me uh, my opinion on these. These are some old snails collected in 18, well, described in 1852. Uh, right. They're from uh, New Zealand. So he was asking about the history of these. Um, if we had, you know, I'm going to take some images for him of the, the features uh, he's interested in. Yeah. Uh, and then another colleague of mine, um, some French and Australian, we're working on a project looking at uh, Guy Coburn Robson, who is one of the people that did my job uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Oh, cool. So I was searching out a scrap of his handwriting, and I found this in a handwriting book this morning when I first got in. Uh, I, I, this is a, a curator I love. Right? Uh, I have real affinity, not just because he did uh, the same job as me, but he had pretty terrible handwriting. Like it, so, um, yeah, so that's what I've been doing so far this morning. Amazing. That's super cool, and I'd love to get into We're, we're surrounded by loads of really cool specimens, so we'd love to get into more of those. Um, first up, I believe you have a mystery specimen for us that some of our viewers may have already seen on our communities I online. Do. So we've got that set up here in the visualizer. So we'll probably cut to this right now so people can have a good look. But we've already had a few guesses in from um, our audience uh, online of what it could be. Now don't reveal what it is because okay. we'll come to it at the end of the show. But I just wanted to let you know what some people have guessed. Um, someone thinks it could be a squid. 
Okay, okay, nice. Um, some things that could be a tusk shell. Ooh, good guess. Okay, and then also we've had toothpick of a T-Rex. <laughs> That's my favourite. <laughs> Not quite a mollusk, but I think it's a great guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we've actually already had a question in already from James, um, who's asking, what is a mollusk? That's a very good question, I think. Yeah, so mollusks are a really diverse group of animals. It's been a, a long record of them, um, either the fossil record, um, and they've, because they've been around for such long, they're diversified to lots of different body forms. But the types of animals that people would be very familiar with are slugs and snails that might find in their garden. Yes. They're mollusks. Uh, sea slugs, sea snails, um, that live in the sea, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, clams, mussels and oysters, things, bivalves as we call them, things that have two shells. Um, many people eat these species, or some right. of them. Uh, and then the cephalopods, so squid, mm. octopus, cuttlefish and their relative. Wow. And despite, you know, you've got something like... Very different. Very different. Very you've different. got a giant squid, you've got a garden snail, they all have some features in common. Um, one of those being a calcium-based shell. Right. Um, so uh, if you've uh, ever seen a cuttlebone in a budgie cage, yeah. that's the internal shell of a cuttlefish. Oh, okay. And that's squid like a not shell, have, yeah, it's a inside. shell, an internal. So over, right. through evolution, they've reduced in size. Okay. So they don't have that protective element that we, we see in snails. Um, or the nautilus, which is the only uh, cephalopod to have an external shell. Yeah. So they have a more of a, a role in structure and that's buoyancy. That's like the one that looks a bit like a cinnamon roll, right? Yeah, it, perfect. Like Great an description. extinct ammonite kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so they're not actually related to ammonites directly, but they they very similar form. Okay, cool. Um, excellent. So um, I think it'd be great to have a look at some of those different mollusks, because I know you've got a selection of different kind of specimens here. Can we look at, um, well, I'll let you choose, maybe a squid, snail, okay. what do you want to start off with? So I'm going to go with octopus. Excellent. Yeah. And everyone watching along, make sure to submit your questions through to John. Um, and if there's any specific mollusks that you'd like to see while we're here, let us know in the chat and we'll get to as many as we've got time for. So this is a common octopus. I'm just right. going to lift it up Put that there. to here. And what I love about... Uh, Lots of the specimens are not just the actual animals themselves, which are, of course, wondrous, but some of the stories that go with them, the historical characters, the expeditions that are associated with them. Yeah. And this little one was collected by Charles Darwin, the man himself, wow. in 1831 on his Beagle voyage. Uh, and it was one of the first things he collected. And we know this because we have copies of his notes, his journals, and obviously the Captain Fitzroy's journals. And this was collected in Cape Verde, and one of the first stops, if not the first stop, and we also know from Darwin's, uh, and actually from Fitzroy's notes, uh, that Darwin had never seen a live octopus. And when he collected this, he, he really enjoyed the way it moved <laughs> around the pools. And he actually kept it alive for a little while in his cabin uh, wow. to observe it. It is such a strange creature to us as humans. It looks so different to what we kind of recognise. It's just so, it, it looks a bit alien, uh, really. <laughs> definitely. I mean, things like the, the film Arrival, I don't know if you yeah. saw it a few years ago. When I saw those aliens, I was like, oh my goodness, they are squid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think if you think about the name, so cephalopod means head foot. Okay. Because <laughs> you've got basically a head and then attached oh, to the feet. Yeah. Because in these, it's, I guess it's a bit like us having our head in the middle of our body. You've got this bit here, the mantle, where all the organs are. Then you've got the head, to so the eyes and the brain. And then you've got, if not the feet, the arms, poda, Latin for uh, feet, but you've got the arms, the way it manoeuvres its way around. So yeah. they are literally a kind of topsy-turvy animal. Yeah, and so the, and just going back, because I, I mean, I kind of glossed over it, but this was the, the specimen that was found on the voyage of the Beagle, and, and so Darwin would have handled this animal when it was alive, and now you're holding this now. Does it feel like you're part of, like, history here at the museum yeah, working? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love... The, the way I think about my role is I, when I retire, a few more years, um, <laughs> then, you know, I've played a part in making the collections better, adding new material, re-identing material, keeping it in a better state. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that there were people doing that before me and there'll yeah. be people doing that after me. And, you know, maybe in a hundred years, people will be talking about my terrible handwriting or, <laughs> why did he say this was this species? It's oh, obviously it's one this. of my favourite curators because they've also got bad handwriting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'd like to be in that club, please. <laughs> and yeah, it's a real honour and a privilege to, yeah. to know that it's just a, a temporary custodianship of this, making these available for a worldwide um, scientific and public audience. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Wow, and you that's can see, incredible. For example, people are often surprised that we uh, kind of use the specimens. You know, they're not just for display. You can see someone's uh, cut it open yeah. to remove the mouth parts. Yeah. They've even dissected the mantle. What does a, um, a mouth part of an octopus look like? Well, 
I don't have an octopus for a mouth, uh, a mouth part of an octopus, but I have a mouth part of a squid. Okay, so gonna... well, it would be great to have a look at that as yeah. well. It's a big one, it's slightly bigger than that. It definitely come, doesn't come from this species. So let's have a look right, in this one. Let's have a look. So this oh, wow. is the mouth part That's massive. from a colossal squid. So there is a, a, a species called the colossal squid. Uh, they only live in Antarctic waters. Yeah. We've never found a fully grown one. They found kind of sub-adult juveniles wow. of around nine meters. <laughs> And scientists kind of argue about how big they get, but they could get to between, I don't know, 12 to 18 meters isn't a terror, isn't like an out of the world estimate. 18, some people think is too large, but that's kind of what- 18 meters, how long, that's, is that as long as a football pitch or is that bigger? I wonder. You're asking the wrong person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, very big. It's longer yeah. than a double-decker bus. Okay, right, yeah. That's so, huge. So giant squid, uh, which are another species, uh, that we found adults of those, and the females get to about 12 meters, the males about 10, but we think these get bigger. If they don't get bigger, they're definitely bulkier. They have a much bigger body mass. Right. But they have a very large beak. And all cephalopods have a beak of like this. Obviously, yeah. different sizes. Smaller ones have a much smaller one. Uh, and you can see they're called a beak because they look, I think they look a bit like a parrot's beak. It does. I'm, I mean, I'm just like transfixed by this because it is, it's kind of terrifying to look <laughs> at. It is like a, yeah, like a huge parrot's beak or it's like a, like a dinosaur, but it's dinosaur size, like a like a triceratops or something that we've seen in previous episodes of Hidden Treasures. It's it's huge. <laughs> yeah, and this uh, actually these uh, this one actually came from the stomach of a sperm whale, because oh, wow. sperm whales are about the only thing big enough to eat giant squid and colossal squid. Right. And in the past, when whaling was common, they'd often put scientists on board who'd go through the stomach contents, pull out the bits, and in fact, the first colossal squid remains. It was described from a partially digested. A uh, specimen removed from a sperm whale stomach, actually from our man, Mr. Robson, whose terrible handwriting we saw <laughs> earlier. The circle is now complete. Uh, but yeah, so a lot of our work on early um, deep sea cephalopods was done on this kind of half regurgitated, half chewed stomach wow. content. That is incredible. And these are incredibly sharp. They're actually a hundred times sharper at the tip than the base. And they have to do that to break through any of the tissue. Uh, and what would they chomp. eat with these beaks? So we don't really know what colossal squid eat. Right. Uh, There's very little work, but we think due to their mass, and the way we think they move through the water, they're probably opportunistic hunters, sort of grabbing big fish, maybe mm. big squid um, that come past them, but they're not very uh, gainly, they're not very bullet-like, you know. Right. They're probably, yeah, ambush predators, as we right, say. Right, got it. That is so, so cool. Wow. Um, we've got loads and loads of questions yeah. coming through now. Um, where to begin, actually? So, actually, while we're talking about this, Colossal Squid, um, Emma's asked, what's the largest and smallest mollusk that you have in the collection? Okay, I, don't, I haven't brought it with me. That's all right. Um, but <laughs> this is a model uh, based on our Archie uh, of a giant squid. So we have an 8.62 meter giant squid yeah. in the basement, which is available, you can see, on our Behind the Spins Spirit Tours. Yes. Um, and you can see most of its length is made up from the tentacles. Yeah. Uh, and they have... Uh, Two long tentacles and then eight shorter arms. Yeah. And then you can see the mantle here and the, the eyes here. Uh, but yeah, that's the largest that we have in the collection. Yeah. The smallest, I was thinking about <laughs> this. So the smallest snail uh, ever found uh, was discovered only last year and yeah. it was 0.6 millimeters here, in diameter. Okay, this is so small, I'm not actually sure we'll have to see it. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm so terrified of losing it. Yeah, yeah, let's keep it in. The dot. Let's, let's in that, zoom that out a bit. Okay, okay, if you can zoom there, can you see this? I think this is the smallest one we have in the collection. Right, so in this the bottom is, corner there. That is tiny. It's about the size of a grain of sand. Yeah. Um, so the one found was slightly smaller than this, but this is Angusta Pillar. <laughs> and this came from a limestone cave in Vietnam. Um, it was actually described by the same people that he uh, discovered these, these other small ones. Uh, and yeah, they found in sort of limestone cave deposits. Uh, and the only way you are going to find them is by sort of sieving through the, the dirt that you get in these caves. Right. Uh, and yeah, amazingly and then, tiny. How are they going to... So, so... Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so small. So you sieve through the dirt. Yep. And then you must have like a, a microscope trained on all of those grains that are coming exactly. through. Exactly. I mean, you oh get, when goodness. you're doing work like this, you get this kind of molluscan <laughs> sixth sense. So yeah. I haven't collected these, but I've collected micro mollusks that occur on limestone cliffs, things like yeah. that. And it's like those magic eye pictures you used to get in the 90s. You have yeah. to stare at this limestone cliff and slowly your eyes just kind of get trained on these very small things and you get a pin and you collect them off with that. Uh, it's quite satisfying work. That is incredible. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for that question. That was a great one. Um, 
we've got a, we've got a fun question here from James. What's the plural of octopus? Because there's been so many <laughs> options thrown about from an expert. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of, con of, of sort of controversy because it, uh, it depends if it's a Latin or Greek. Mm -hmm. And then the word octopus is a Latinized Greek word. So if you're going to go letter of the law, it's octopuses. Okay. It's the plural. Uh, octopodes is acceptable. Octopodes. Yeah. So octopi is out. Octopi is that's, out. That's fake. But okay. Yeah, but octopus is, is what I use. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Thank you so much, James, for that question. Um, and then we've got quite a lot of um, questions coming through from one from Maximilian and one from Eileen about what kind of mollusks we can find in the UK and are they endangered at all in the UK as well? So I thought I brought a little sheet with me, but maybe <laughs> I didn't. So there's about 100 species of terrestrial right. snail. Yeah. Far more than most people realise than the, that exist in this country. Uh, and there's about five or six of those are kind of what we call hot house aliens. So you're only going to find them in a greenhouse or a garden centre. They're, yeah. they're kind of tropical, not quite pests, but visitors that won't survive in your <laughs> garden, but they might survive in a greenhouse or a conservatory or right. a, a garden centre. But about 100, let's say. Most of those are actually not rare, not mm -hmm. endangered. A few of them, um, things like the Roman snail, Helix pomatia R, they're uh, restricted, you shouldn't touch them. If you find them, they're the large uh, edible snail that they eat in uh, traditional, you know, kind of, if you think of the traditional French restaurant yeah. that you pull them out, um, the escargot snail. Yeah. Uh, and there's a few other wetland species which are rarish or locally rare because they only uh, exist in sort of small drainage areas. And often these kind of low sort of wetland areas are at risk of drainage. Um, when you change of land use, for example, mm -hmm. building roads or you know, building houses. Um, but most of our land snail fauna is actually kind of a subset of the European fauna. So right. ice age, wiped out, and then everything kind of recolonized afterwards. So we don't have any endemics, we don't have anything that's only found in this country. That's yeah. for the terrestrial snails. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't do things in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. That's great. Um, I think it would be great to um, have a look at more snails because we've had a look Always. at the cephalopods. I mean, and they're fascinating, but I would love to look at some snails. Although I have just noticed that you've brought out this print here. Um, they, this, these seem to be slugs. So they are slugs and semi-slugs. Semi-slugs. Yeah. They've got weird bumps on their back. Yeah. So slugs and snails are very closely related. In fact, most slugs are more related to other snails than they are to other slugs. So being a slug has evolved probably five to seven times. So, and what I mean by that is the reduction of shell. So snails, different snail families, have lost their shells mm -hmm. several times through different events. So they completely lose it? Not completely. Okay. That's the interesting okay. thing. So uh, let's find a slug. So here is one here. So you can see this kind of, I don't know, so, sort of, I don't know, this round fingers print sized structure here. Yeah. This is the shell underneath the skin that presses against the skin. Oh. And in some species you get caused with a semi-slug where the, slug, the shell has been reduced, oh. but not completely covered. It's still showing, So you can still yeah. see, and some of them uh, are more snaily than sluggy, so you get one where you, you get a shell but the animal can't retract into it. Uh, but some of them it's just more like a little, a little fingernail on the back and some of them is completely internal. And you can sometimes find, if you can't find a slug, sometimes you can just find the shell on their own if you're sifting through the soil, or in mm. a, especially in calcium rich areas. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, slugs and snails, they're basically the same thing. Okay. Different versions, <laughs> different species of uh, the same big group. That's super cool. We've got so many questions <laughs> coming through. Um, I guess maybe on that sort of note, um, we've had a question come through from James asking, what in the collection do you think that doesn't get enough attention? Mm. Whoa, what? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go for another small one. Yes. Uh, this is actually my favourite snail. Everyone should have a, 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 uh, a favourite snail. And I, the reason I, I think this is quite interesting is snails are a, a really undervalued group, I think, in the eyes of the general public. I mean, for example, we just taught the fact there are 100 species of snail. And I think if you ask most people, they'd be very comfortable saying, oh, I have to see two or three in my garden. Yeah. You know, there's a, a 50, 60 odd species of slug in this country. People don't know. And I think people... I don't know why. I think lots of invertebrate groups, the public just, we don't go out, you know, 